Thank you so much, uh, Bonnie, for your kind words. And thanks to you so much to Kara for hosting this forum. It's been fantastic so far. And I just want to start off by saying thank you so much, Alicia. I am such a huge fan of yours. That was such an inspiring way to kick off the forum. And then it was great to hear from fantastic colleagues and allies, really, um, Mike McGuire and Mike Thompson. You know, one of the things that's so wonderful about working with men like them is that they really stand up as allies for women, for working people, for children. Um, and they just are people that I feel like I can count on. Good people, right? That's we need more good people in government who fundamentally care about others. And that's what I love most about them. So I'm going to go into a few different things really as quickly as I can, because I want to save some time for questions. Number one, county budget. Number two, fire update. And then number three, ballot. So I'm going to start with the good news, which is the good news is that the Board of Supervisors on Friday voted to adopt a $1.9 billion budget for 2020 and 2021 that avoids layoffs while making critical investments in areas such as fire recovery, permanent supportive housing, COVID-19 response, food programs, senior services, as well as mental health and homeless services. We did this by allocating discretionary one-time funds, including more than $24 million of PG&E settlement funds that were related to the 2017 wildfires. Um, during our department presentations on July 27th and 28th, department and agency managers identified a total of $38.5 million in reductions, including about 55 potential employee layoffs. But the good news is that we were actually able to avoid those layoffs while setting aside funds for important programs that keep us on the road to recovery. We're still recovering from the 17 wildfires, the 2019 wildfires, the 2019 flood, as well as, of course, the current pandemic crisis that we find ourselves in, as well as the Wallbridge and Myers fires. So a few of the highlights from that budget, $20 million for COVID-19 response, including expanded free testing for the public. $8.5 million in PG&E funds to backfill the county's reserve funds, which unfortunately we had to draw down during 2017. We felt like it was important to have that cushion back there because we can't seem to get out of disaster mode in Sonoma County. We invested $5.5 million to expand the county's mobile support team, which is responding to mental health crises out in the community. And we also identified $2 million to assist with the purchase of two hotels. Hotel Azura in Santa Rosa and the Sebastopol Inn in Sebastopol, which would be used for permanent supportive housing through the governor's project home key program to try to get folks off the street and into housing um, so that you know, we can take care of the most vulnerable members of our society. We also identified $384,000 for food distribution, specifically focused around seniors, as well as um, an additional $355,000 to strengthen overall support for homeless services and the Home Sonoma County Leadership Council. Um, you know, we know, unfortunately, that we are not going to be able to have these kinds of one-time funds every year. Um, and we also know that because of our economic situation, the county is projecting flat revenue growth in the months to come, resulting in potential annual deficits in the future. So we will, we're not out of the woods. We were able to do some good work this year, um, but we still are concerned about the long-term forecast for Sonoma County. Now, um, let's go ahead and switch over to fires. So as you all know, uh, fire season unfortunately started very early for us this year with the eruption of the Wallbridge and the Myers fires on August 17th. They have burned more than 57,000 acres in Northwest Sonoma County. The Wallbridge fire, unfortunately, is still smoldering, but at last count, the good news is it was 97% contained. The fire destroyed 298 structures, including 159 homes. And while that's very tragic, and my heart goes out to all of the fire survivors who unfortunately lost their home, remarkably, the firefighters were able to save nearly 500 homes in the burn zone itself. This is pretty remarkable given how many remote um, you know, areas we have that were touched by this fire and these, these homes, many of them were in extremely difficult to access areas. Cal Fire Incident Commander Sean Cavanaugh said that we normally would have had up to 4,000 Cal Fire fighters working on a fire the size of the Wall Bridge. But because the fire crews were spread so thin across the state responding to all of the different lightning fires that were burning, Cal Fire only had 1,500 personnel at one point working on both the Wallbridge Fire as well as the Hennessy Fire in Napa, Lake, Yolo, and Solano counties, which was five times larger than the Wallbridge to give you a sense of scale between the Hennessy and the Wallbridge. Um, meanwhile, some of our fire crews have now been dispatched to help out at other fires throughout the West Coast. 
Already in 2020, more than 3.1 million acres have burned statewide. Um, combined, the LNU complex fires in the North Bay, which include the Wallbridge and Myers fires, destroyed more than 363,000 acres, making it the fourth largest fire in state history. Um, so that is, you know, very challenging um, and, you know, we, we continue to deal with the constant threat of wildfire in Sonoma County, but the good news is we are making some critical investments in vegetation management and in fire services in this year's Sonoma County budget. With that, I'm going to shift over to the measures that are being put on the ballot by your Sonoma County Board of Supervisors. We have two local countywide measures that are put on the ballot by the Board of Supervisors. One is Measure O. And that's a quarter cent sales tax for 10 years to fund mental health services. This will enable us to expand both that early intervention piece as well as the crisis response piece. Um, given the repeated traumas that we have experienced in Sonoma County, and of course the social anxiety and social isolation has come with the pandemic crisis in particular, I you know, really personally feel that this is more important than ever before. And as a reminder, um, you know, of course, sales taxes, it's not the most ideal. They do have a regressive element and hit folks who are lower income harder, but it does not apply to food. And unfortunately, I've heard some misinformation being spread by some of the anti-tax groups out there saying that your grocery bill is going to go up and food items are not subject to sales tax, just as a reminder. Um, the other one is Measure P, which is the also known as the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance. This would strengthen law enforcement oversight in Sonoma County. And I think that Senator Mike McGuire really hit it out of the park before when he said, you know what, most peace officers in the state of California are good people. They are doing hard work every day. They care about their community and they are invested in their community. But at the same point, we do need to have mechanisms for holding them accountable if they in fact are not operating in the best interest of the community. And the Evelyn Cheatham Ordinance does provide us with some additional oversight capacity. Again, with some misinformation, it does not actually decrease the sheriff's office. It is not going to defund Henry One, which, by the way, the Board of Supervisors did agree to continue um, the program and invested money for two years with the goal of actually transitioning it to a more fire focused model. Um, so those are kind of the two major initiatives that were put on by the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors. I want to just end by saying that it is truly everything that everyone has said before. This is the defining moment of our time. And we absolutely have to get out and vote in November. Vote like our lives depend on it. Vote like our county depends on it. Vote like our country depends on it because it does. And I would say, you know, can we do more than just vote? You know, my husband has already signed up to text for Biden and Harris. And so he's having, you know, text conversations with some of those critical voters in swing states like McGuire mentioned, you know, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona, Wisconsin, Florida, and Ohio. And so sometimes those one on one interactions can be extremely valuable, especially in the midst of a pandemic when everyone, quite frankly, is starved for human contact. So consider not only voting, but consider actually fighting for what you believe in, because now is that opportunity. And I feel like, you know, folks like Alicia just bring so much passion and, and personal history. And I mean, if we could all capture just a tenth of that spirit that Alicia brought to us this morning, and we were able to convey that to voters in other states, that will make a difference. Um, it, at the end of the day, voting is a personal decision and you can influence folks people to, you know, person to person, that, that relationship, you know, try to reach out to a stranger, establish a relationship and see if you can convince them to vote um, for what they believe in this year. So with that, I will turn it um, over to questions and I apologize. I, you know, my bandwidth has been fine all day. And of course, the moment that I, you know, it's my turn to speak, somehow something's going on strange with my rural internet connection out here. So I apologize if you couldn't see me. Um, I didn't want to, you know, try to reboot the router in the middle of the, of the talk. So, but I would love to hear from you and answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you, uh, Supervisor Hopkins. We're so glad that you're here with us. And uh, so we'll open it for questions now. So again, uh, star nine, if you're on, phone and raise your hand on Zoom. So are there any questions? I'll just ask this right off while we're waiting. Um, are you in support of um, Proposition 15? That's the, the schools and communities. Um, I have, have, 
Yes, I, I absolutely am. Um, that is the commercial uh, real estate uh, Prop 13 revision. Yes, I'm like, I'm, I'm so immersed in our letters, you know, and the local <laughs> propositions that I have to kind of lift my head up and remember what the numbers are for the state propositions as well. Um, but yes, I am absolutely in support of that. And I think that that would provide a critical investment. Um, our schools, especially in West County, have really, truly struggled. Um, you know, with declining enrollment, with increasing um, costs uh, that are absolutely needed to invest in teacher salaries. We actually had some of the lowest paid teachers in Sonoma County um, out in West County. And so it's critical that we, you know, allow teachers to afford to live here and that we also have an opportunity to repair some of our failing and aging infrastructure as it pertains to schools. Um, and those are challenges that aren't going away. So, yes. Thank you. We have a we have a hand raised, David Walker. David Walker, could you unmute, please? Hi, Linda. Thank you for your work you do. Uh, my question is: with all the homeless out there, there are a lot of these people that would really like to have a job. Why can't we start something like the WPA to put these people to work and give them some sense of community? You know, that is a fantastic question. And actually, um, before the latest disaster, um, right before the pandemic started, I was working with the Teamsters on an opportunity of um, actually getting some of our unsheltered residents trained to drive trucks. And we were planning on bringing a satellite program, operating it out of the Sonoma County Fairgrounds um, and getting folks trained, because there is actually a huge demand for truck drivers. Um, we've got Recology, we've got Gelati, we've got various companies that are constantly trying to get folks who have, um, you know, those higher class license um, classifications to be able to drive those trucks. And so that was, that is still remains a goal. And unfortunately, some of this in-person training has been very complicated by the pandemic. And so it got put on hold. Um, but that is absolutely something that I want to return to. And another opportunity, I think, is we have a huge need for vegetation management um, and wildfire risk reduction. I was on a Zoom meeting last night with the Friends of Rio Nido who were talking about how can we mobilize folks to come in and deal with some of the vegetation management and some of the publicly owned lands around that community, which was at high risk from the Wallbridge fire. So I think there are a lot of opportunities, um, and it's just trying to figure out how do we navigate this in the midst of a pandemic where those in-person trainings become more expensive and more complicated and you can't have as many folks in the room at the time. So um, that's absolutely something that is necessary. I think it also, I mean, we did a, a little pilot program in the Russian River called Clean Streets, where we actually um, provided vouchers to unsheltered residents in exchange for cleaning up the downtown. And what we learned from that is that, you know, there was really a sense of pride and identity and it fostered such positive community relationships, you know, suddenly they were being thanked for their work, right? They were being appreciated by the community. Um, and it also gave them a sense of being part of a team. And so I think that it, it also has a tremendous social value. Um, some of the things that I hear from folks that I speak to who went through the experience of homelessness was how just dehumanizing and devaluing it was, how they said, you know, you would stand there on the street and people would just walk by you or look through you like you didn't exist. And so they feel very isolated from society. And if there's an opportunity to bring them back into society and in a way that empowers them, I think that's an extremely uh, wonderful, wonderful thing to do. And I, I look forward to doing it. One of the challenges is funding, because we actually, you know, the federal and state governments, they want to just fund putting people into houses. And that's only part of it, right? It's also about rehabilitating them and getting them part of that community and, and helping them get back to work. So. Thank you. Have a question. We have a question in the chat from Leo, Le, Leona Judson. Leona Judson, what is the status of the Sebastopol Inn? That is a great question. Um, and I actually did just receive an email from Director of Health Services and Interim CDC Director Barbie Robinson about that. Um, CDC was notified informally that um, the home key application for the acquisition of the Azura Hotel in Santa Rosa was approved. However, the Sebastopol Inn um, did meet the requirements, but it's on a wait list due to an oversubscription <clears throat> of the program. The CDC is also looking at, are there other local funds that could be utilized for the acquisition of that facility? So we're a little bit in limbo right now um, with the Sebastopol Inn, with it being on the wait list for the state funding and then looking at, or might there be other opportunities for funding on a local level? So we're, we're in a holding pattern there. We have a hand raised from Chris and Tom. 
You're unmuted. Um, yeah, Linda, um, our supervisor is uh, Susan Gorham, but I would like um, the Board of Supervisors, all of you, to consider um, the influence you have um, in terms of Proposition 15 and bringing money, sorely needed money, to um, an area that is you know, facing financial catastrophe from the pandemic, the economic um, outcome of the pandemic and fires multiple years. And um, just to see if you folks can act as a megaphone to at least our county to amplify the importance of the ongoing, the annual um, financial benefit of Proposition 15. We could get $185 million every year going forward if the huge corporations that are part of this effort would just pay their fair share. So I would like to encourage you and all the Board of Supervisors to help us convince people to vote that way. Thank you. Absolutely. I think that's really important. And um, I feel very blessed and, and honored to be one of the leaders in our fantastic community. And, you know, a lot of folks are starting to ask me, how are you voting? You know, who are you voting for? Who do you support for these different city council races? I do think it's really important that we lift up our voices to try to get those critical resources into our community. And thank you so much for your comments. If you have any suggestions on how to make that megaphone louder or where, where we should be shouting, um, let me know and I would love to hear it. And I will, will happily do as you suggested. Why can't uh, this Board of Supervisors start doing weekly Zooms or something to heighten the importance of some of these propositions that affect Sonoma County? Maybe, I don't know if there's money, if that's the problem, how to get um, a, a, a Zoom forum that you know highlights this stuff at least till the election of 2020 because after that, it's kind of over. We're cooked. However way this comes out in November in a lot of ways, and this is our time. This is our window. That's our <laughs> I think that's um, a, a great idea. And we have to be careful on the government side because we can't be advocating, um, you know, sort of politically on government time. And so we couldn't have formal Board of Supervisors virtual Zooms, but I would love to work with the local amazing Democratic Club that we've got here in Sonoma County um, you know, and see what we can do to put on some some virtual town halls and to try to get the word out. I think that the virtual town halls are a great idea. And we've had a lot of success just even with, you know, Facebook Live and simple things that the folks can then watch the video, you know, if they didn't have an opportunity to tune in while it was happening. And I think that's a fantastic idea. We have two more hands raised. Up next is Pat Babb. Hi, thank you, Supervisor. Uh, what, where are we on reopening somewhat the schools and other areas of the county? Do you, is there any time frame, any thought on that? That's a great question. And unfortunately, we are currently in the, I think it's the purple tier of the state system, right. um, which is the kind of worst tier to be in. I'll just be very sorry. Just so buckle in and get to red yeah. before we can even think. What they say was we, before we can even start to think about opening schools. And that's entirely dependent upon our data. Um, I've had a couple conversations with Dr. Mesa, sort of what are we missing here in Sonoma County? You know, because Napa was rated better than we are now. Marin, I understand, yeah. has come off of the list as of this morning. And so, you know, I, it concerns me that we don't seem to be trending in the right direction. And so I really want to talk about how can we make sure that, you know, is it do we need to speed up our track and trace? We did just invest a lot of money in COVID response, and I'm hoping that that upstaffing will help us get our arms around the pandemic here in Sonoma County because our, our rate of infection and our um, fatality rate is still way too high, in my opinion. Um, and I, I think it's just so critical that we do everything we can to drive down that rate, and then we can start talking about opening our schools. So unfortunately right now, I, I hate to say it, but there's just no timeline um, until those numbers change. I would like to see Dr. Mays come on a, um, a Zoom uh, program like this with the Board of Supervisors. It seems that she's always out there kind of on her own. And um, I, I, I would like to see her with the supervisors in, in a question and answer uh, session and 
um, where she can give more of an explanation of what she's doing and what she's looking at. I think that's a great idea. Um, and we before, early on in the pandemic, we were doing weekly COVID-19 updates with the Board of Supervisors and Dr. Meese. And then that kind of tapered off um, yeah. and we've been, you know, in the midst of fires and budgets, but I think we need to get back to that. I would also the, extend the invitation that if you all ever want to hold a forum, I can absolutely get Dr. Mace to attend that. So you could have a Q and A with her personally. Um, I've, I've invited her to a number of different stakeholder groups in West County to meet with, you know, first responders and, and others. And so you're absolutely a critical stakeholder group. And I would love to make that connection if you'd like to speak with her directly. Yes. Thank you. I would. Our last question comes from Jennifer Laporte. Hi, Supervisor Hopkins. Thank you so much for your service to the community. I really appreciate you being here and answering our questions. You know, I wasn't paying attention, I guess, and you mentioned a proposition that had something to do with preventive measures or um, curative measures for the mental health, something to do with money coming in for mental health services and i'm wondering if you could elaborate on that absolutely so this is a measure o which the sonoma county board of supervisors put on the ballot it's a quarter cent sales tax for 10 years um, so it would generate around 25 million dollars a year and the sole goal is to really invest in mental health services including actually um, counseling and supportive services at schools and in, part, in particular, we do have a partnership with Sonoma State and SRJC um, to provide that kind of service to our, um, our students there as well. So it would be investing in the mobile support team. It would be investing in our um, crisis stabilization unit and, and a PUF, which is a psychiatric healthcare facility in Sonoma County, um, essentially trying to just bolster our system of care. You know, this is a, an, a, an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. My, both of my brothers actually uh, suffer from mental health challenges. And um, at one point, while my, my youngest brother was living in Sonoma County, he, because he was on Obamacare and he was having issues, he couldn't get his um, prescription refilled or adjusted. And he knew that it was wrong and he knew he didn't feel right. And he knew that he was sort of tending to, towards suicidal ideation. Um, and he actually went to our crisis stabilization unit. This was many years ago, and I believe there have been reforms that were implemented since, and was told that he wasn't suicidal enough to be admitted. So he had to go back home and wait until he got decompensated to the point where he was, quote unquote, suicidal enough in order to be admitted to the crisis stabilization unit. And that is not how mental health care should be provided in the county, right? That is a failure of the system. That is a giant hole in our safety net. And so really trying to focus on early intervention, trying to make sure that we have enough mental health care services that are on the upstream side, not waiting for someone to get to that crisis point, but then also making sure that if they get to that crisis point, that we have a robust system of care where that's an, an entry point, right? So you take the person in crisis and you ensure that they're not in, winding up in a combative um, sort of back and forth with law enforcement, but they have a clinician there and the clinician is about getting them stabilized and then making sure that, okay, do they need to have a follow-up appointment scheduled? So it's really about trying to strengthen that overall safety net. Um, and so when you read the, the measure and you look at the expenditure plan, it's pretty complicated. You know, it's a million for this and, you know, 2.3% for that. Um, but that's really what it's getting at. So it'll feel a little scattershot when you look at it. But the point is to just bolster that holistic system of care, both on the upstream side and then also on the crisis response side. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing your personal story. I, I really appreciate that. And I empathize with you. It also seems like if this measure were to pass, it would really lift some of the burden from law enforcement who are usually the ones called for these situations. Absolutely. And I, I, every, you know, law enforcement officer and leader in the county that I have spoken to on this topic says, you know, we're the wrong person for that call, right? You know, sometimes we need to be there as backup, right? They need to make sure that there's not a situation that, that if it escalates, they want to make sure that everybody's safe. But at the end of the day, they're not mental health clinicians. And so, you know, they just, unfortunately, our largest mental health care facility in Sonoma County is the Sonoma County Jail, right? Um, and we also see a tremendous uh, sort of overlap between mental health challenges and then also on homelessness. And so, you know, it's going to take 
really focusing on mental health um, to alleviate some of those, those challenges, both with respect to the jail and with respect to homelessness. And then also just with respect to people like my brother who are trying their best and they're slipping through the cracks because we don't have that kind of upstream access to um, therapists and psychiatrists to respond in real time.